Thank you so much, Pastor Chuck. Thank you, Pastor John, for uh, reminding us that God is a chain breaker no matter what we go through. Uh, this morning, if you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to go ahead and be turning to the New Testament book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, as we kind of tackle uh, the second part of uh, verse 21 and following uh, Paul writes, to live is Christ, to die is gain. We kind of looked at the, the live is Christ part last week, and we'll kind of look at the second part of that verse, and then the struggle that the Apostle Paul has uh, with the, the gain part. Uh, as uh, we think about that this morning, on Saturday mornings, uh, I'm not sure what time it's on, uh, Eastern time, it was kind of on early uh, in Mountain Time, but there's a little show called Cashin' In. Anybody ever seen Cashin' In on Fox News Channel? One person, Ken, I'll get a couple. <laughs> if you've got 401 retirement accounts, if you've got investments, it's just kind of a fun show about investing and cashing in and one of the main guys until he passed away earlier this year was Wayne Rogers who uh, played Trapper John on the original MASH series. How many of you remember that? All right. Amen. Amen. He was not played, and, and Brenda and I have this kind of running thing. There was a later series called Trapper John, M.D. Anybody remember that? That, he, that was played by an imposter called Pernell Roberts. That was really not. He, he might have been great as Adam on a Bonanza, but that, you know, Trapper John, M.D., he was not. That's Wayne Rogers. Uh, well, Rain, Wayne Rogers and some of the other guys, very entertaining show about when to buy, when to sell, when to kind of cash in. And so the, the last week, I've just been hearing, just kind of here and there, and, and somebody that I was with this past week basically was saying, you know, the election's coming no, November 8th, before November 8th, you might want to just cash it all in and get out of the market entirely. I, you know, I'm kind of like long-term investing, but there's a lot of people that are saying, you know, with the election coming up, cash it all in. Well, to, to get everything you've got now, because it's better to get it all now. Well, that same principle, cashing in, can also be used as a euphemism for death. He, he cashed it in. He cashed it all in. Well, this morning, as we look at the second part of verse 21 and following, we're going to look at that term, to die is gain. And the Apostle Paul uses this term, to die is gain. And really, it means simply this, to cash in both principal and interest all at once. And so for Paul, to live as Christ, to die is very much better. You can't even begin to describe it as very much better what the Apostle Paul says, to die is gain. What would he gain? He would gain Christ. He would gain deliverance from his present conditions. He was literally in chains. And he knew that God would deliver him either literally from those chains or ultimately to a very real place in heaven because God, as we sang a moment ago, is a chain breaker. But he would be delivered from his imprisonment and his present conditions. He would gain eternal life. He would gain joy unspeakable. He would gain healing. Who could blame Paul? for having such a desire. In fact, uh, who can blame anyone uh, for having such a desire? In our current conditions, culturally and perhaps even personally, we too can struggle with a desire to stay here and live for Christ and a desire to cash it all in to go be with Jesus in heaven. I don't know how many times that I've talked with Christians about their desire to go home to heaven or for Jesus to come again right now. And I've heard so many that have been praying for Jesus to return at least sometime before a week from Tuesday. Amen. We understand the desire to, to live as Christ, but to die is gain, and that is very much better. That desire is completely reasonable and understandable. In fact, who, who wouldn't want to be in the presence of Jesus in heaven? Who wouldn't want to be reunited with loved ones in heaven? Who wouldn't want to be free of pain and suffering? Who wouldn't want to escape the moral decay that we see all around us? Who would not want to have complete and total joy and peace? 
to stay men. The struggle between living for Christ on earth and being with Christ in heaven is one that we will always have with us. This morning, as we continue our study in the book of Philippians, what can we learn from the Apostle Paul's struggle that might help us with our struggle and desire to cash it all in to gain Christ? If you have your copy of God's Word and able to stand, I invite you to stand as we read. We'll pick up in verse 21 through verse 26, Philippians chapter 1. Paul writes, for to, me is li- for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. We'll come back to that particular part of the verse in just a moment. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. In the Greek, it really is this, for that is very much better. It's just heaping, it's it's unimaginable how much better that is but verse 24 but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account the account of the Philippian church convinced of this I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming again to you father we thank you this morning uh, that to live is Christ to die is gain And Father, I thank you that this morning you still have work for us to do. And until that work is done, uh, we will not gain heaven. Father, I pray that even as we struggle between our desire to stay here and our desire to be with you in heaven, uh, that you would help us to continue to work as long as you have us here or until Jesus comes. Uh, Father, guide and direct us this morning through your word that we might not just hear it, but might we put it into practice in our day-to-day life, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, Folks, as Paul writes, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And so the question this morning, uh, when can we cash it all in? When can we get that gain? The Apostle Paul clearly tells us here that only when the work is done. Only when the work is done. Notice in verse 22, if I'm to live in the flesh, that means what? Fruitful labor for me. There was still fruitful labor for the Apostle Paul. There was still work for him to do. And there is still work for us to do today. 150 years after the founding of this church, there is still work to do in this church. There's still work to do in this community. There is still work to do all around us. Why? Because upwards of 90% of folks in this county, 90% of folks in Northern Virginia, 90% of folks in the Commonwealth of Virginia, regardless of what they say their church background is, regardless of what they say their church membership might be, regardless of what religion they might check on the box when they go to the hospital, 90% of folks in this Commonwealth are lost without Jesus Christ as personal Savior and Lord. We're going to try, Brother Charlie. There is still work to do. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul was saying here to the Philippian church. As bad as his circumstances were, as much as he would have liked to have been out of those chains and out of that prison, he says, it is still fruitful work. It is still fruitful labor for me to continue to be here on this earth. And that is the same for each of us. For Paul himself reminds us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, That we are his workmanship, God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He's got work for us to do. He's got work for this church to do. He's got work for each and every one of us that are part of this church to do. Why? Because none of us are here by accident or coincidence. It doesn't matter if you've been here for years and years and years or you've just moved into this area and just become a part of Ramoth Baptist Church. None of us are here by accident or coincidence. We are here because God has brought us here for such a time as this. To work. For there is work to be done. What work? are we called to do? Quite simply this, to carry out the Great Commission, to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
to share that Jesus saves. We sang just a moment ago, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the gospel in a nutshell. And folks, we have been given that great commission as the church, as the people of God to go out wherever our feet might take us. And I say that at the end of just about every service, wherever our feet might take us this week, that we're to share the life-transforming powerful gospel of Jesus Christ for it's up to the church it is up to us to do the work of the gospel to do the work of the ministry to do the work that God has called us to do it's not up to the government for the government will never do it it's not up to business for business will never do it it's not up to the entertainment industry for certain the entertainment industry will never do it it's not up to Wall Street because that's not what their interest is folks it's up to the church to do the work that God has called us to do, to carry out, to fulfill the Great Commission, to make disciples as we're going, wherever our feet might take us. And not just that, but also to live out the Great Commandment, to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love other people unconditionally, to share that love of Jesus Christ with them, that, oh, Jesus loves them, and that we love them, and that Jesus came and he died on the cross of Calvary for their sins. And it doesn't matter where they've been, it doesn't matter what they have done, it does not matter their past because God already knows it, and at the cross of Calvary, all of our sins, past, present, and future, are nailed to the cross and we bear them no more. And we can sing, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. For all who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Christ alone and the blood of Christ cleanses from all unrighteousness. We are called to work and to love God and to love people and ultimately as our mission statement says to impact, to change our world beginning right here. We're called to the work. There is still much work to do. There is still much fruitful labor that we can do as a people here at Ramoth Baptist Church, as a people of God here in this nation and in this world. And where are we supposed to do this work? There you go. Did you, did you come up here, Brother Howard, and look at my notes? That's exact. Everywhere. That's the word. Everywhere. Doesn't matter. You got the memo. All right. Everywhere. It doesn't matter. Wherever we are, we're to do the work. Not just here at church, obviously, it begins with the body of Christ as we're doing the work together, moving forward together, 150 years as we continue to press forward together. We do the work, but we do the work of Christ in our family. We are walking letters. And I, I could not have said that, but two Alberts said something similar. We'll get to it. See, I think you kind of snuck up here and read my notes, Brother Day. Or maybe, or maybe you just, it's right here, really. There you go. There you go. Starts with our families too, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I've, I've never met a perfect family. Not us. Nobody here. I, I, I've had at least one person, though, back in New Mexico that I, I said that. I said there are really no such thing as perfect families. That was in like the 815 service, and then uh, she sang you know, special music in, in the 11 o'clock service, and she basically said, well, no, we're, we're kind of a perfect family. <laughs> now, generally, when, when people say that they're a perfect family or perfect marriage or perfect kids, you know what I do? No, I, I take a couple steps back. <laughs> that, yeah, that's... No, there are, are no perfect people, are no perfect families. There is a perfect God. There is a perfect Savior. Amen. And we work. There's work to do in the church. There's work to do in our families. There's work to do for Christ at your job. I, I would imagine how many of you know somebody at your place of work that's not saved, that doesn't know Jesus Christ as personal Savior and Lord? Okay, some of you need to get out more. I saw like three hands go up. All right, you, you, need to, you need to find those unbelievers at, at your work because they're there. If you work in the secular, if you're at the Pentagon, 
I'm going to guess there's some unbelievers at the Pentagon. Yeah. If you're working at one of the military bases, I'm going to guess that there are unbelievers up at Quantico. I'm just going to take a wild guess. And you're probably going to be rubbing shoulders with them. If you work at a secular job, you're going to see them. There's, what? there's work to be done. There are people that still need the Lord. If you go to a public school, just a wild guess that not all of your fellow students and teachers that you have are saved. If you're in college, I'm just guessing at Mary Washington or Germana or wherever you might be, I'm guessing that not all of your fellow students are saved. There's work to be done. In your neighborhood, all of your neighbors, not saved. Your friends, all your friends, not say you'll have an opportunity this Thanksgiving. You may have family members that come and eat around your table and people that you know and your extended that, that are not saved. There's work to be done. And how are we supposed to do that work? We do it heartily as unto the Lord. Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, it's not about working for anybody, but working and serving for him and him alone, because he's the one that has given us the commission. He's the one that has given us the work to do. And so this morning, we just said, how, how are you doing with the work that God's already given you to do? Is your labor fruitful? It, it may not be the same labor that you had 10 years ago, or 25 years ago, or 50 years ago, but if you're here this morning, how many of you are here this morning? Now, that was a trick. <laughs> if you're here this morning, God's got work for you to do. Amen. Doesn't matter how young you are. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. Doesn't matter your station in life. It doesn't matter your background. It matters that right now you are a new creation in Christ, and God's got work for us to do Amen. as a church. Amen. But it's not about us. It wasn't about the Apostle Paul. You see, in verse 22, he says, If I'm to live in the flesh, that means what fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I've, I've looked at that verse, I don't know how many times in my life, and I've always come to the, which I sh shall choose, I cannot tell. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I cannot tell you. I'm not sure. That's not what he means. Not at all. How many of you have a King James Version this morning? In the King James, it, it, it reads this. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. W-O-T. What, what not? What? What? What not? What does that mean? Simply means this. What I shall choose, I simply am not going to make known or declare to you. Not that the Apostle Paul had no idea. Not that the Apostle Paul was clueless. On the contrary, the Apostle Paul knew exactly what he was supposed to do, and that was to stay on earth so that he could not only help the Philippian church, but all the other churches. He simply was not going to allow his personal preference to be in heaven, because after all, if you're the Apostle Paul in that spot, in chains, in Rome, wouldn't you want to have the gain of being in heaven with Christ? But he's like, I know what I'm supposed to do. And I'm not going to allow my personal preference or my desire, as strong of a struggle as that is, and we all have struggles with our preferences and with our desires, as strong as that is, Paul says, I'm simply not going to allow my preferences or my desires to countermand what Jesus has already told me I'm supposed to do. How many of you have ever been uh, told well, let's put it a little stronger. How many of you have ever been commanded to do something? Yeah. We're commanded to do something. And now, how many of you, and Brother Dave, you, you, you may have been commanded to do something, that when you're commanded to do something, you just really would prefer not to have done what you were commanded to do? Anybody ever just prefer that they just wouldn't? How did that go? Not good. I, I, I was kind of, I, I grew up in Florida, and so we're back on the East Coast. Uh, my dad owned a funeral home. We had a lot of grass that needed to be mowed in the summertime, and the original Dixie was not going to do it, and so it became my job to mow the grass, and sometimes 
you well know if it rains a lot, that means twice a week, not just once a week. That wasn't a suggestion. That wasn't a if you feel like it. It wasn't a if your preference is, it was this is what you're going to do. See, our preference when we know what God's told us to do is simply irrelevant. It's, now, we don't like to hear that because, after all, we many times struggle with it being about us and not being about Him. But when we know what God has told us to do, my preference doesn't matter. Paul said, in the end, I cannot tell, not that I don't know, but I'm simply not going to tell you because it doesn't matter. I know what God has called me to do. He's called me to work. He's called me to stay. He's called me to do. And our preferences and our desires, as great as those might be, must be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ when he tells us to do something. We say, yes, sir. No questions asked. God gets to tell us when our work is done. God alone determines when we're finished. Psalm 139, verse 16, the psalmist declares, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. God has our days numbered. We don't know. He does. He's gotten a plan for us. He's got good works that we should walk in them all the days of our life until he calls us home or until Jesus comes again. There is still work to be done. Might we do the work that God has for us to do, no matter what our preferences are, no matter what our desires are, to keep working till Jesus comes. And not just that, but Paul says we keep working until it's time to stop and we keep growing until God says no more you see back here in verse 25 and 26 Paul says convinced of this convinced of his necessity to stay he says I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith you see only when the growth was done spiritually speaking And that growth that Paul is talking about was not yet done in the life of the Philippian church. That growth that we all have, before we can grow and stop growing, we must continue to understand that it is God and God alone that says when the growing is done. But if we're to help others grow, as Paul would help the Philippian church, we must ourselves be growing. Growing in faith and growing in love. Paul puts it this way in 2 Thessalonians 1.3. We, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Don't miss that. Their faith was growing. Their love for one another was growing. But if we're to help each other, if we're to be a church that helps one another, our own personal faith and our love for one another must be growing. That's what Paul is talking about here. And so we can only go as far as we are growing ourselves. Two Alberts put it the same way as Brother Dave just a minute ago. One said this, the three most important ways to lead people are by example, by example, by example, Albert Schweitzer. And another Albert said this, setting an example is not the main means of influencing others, it is the only means. Albert Einstein. Folks, we must continue to grow in faith and in love so that we can then help others to grow. Just like the Apostle Paul, it was for the benefit, it was for the growth of the Philippian church. Folks, we're not here merely for our own growth. We are here that we might help one another to grow up in the faith. It's not about being a lone ranger. It's not about being an individual. It's about being a part of the body of Christ, knit together by God himself, whose ultimate outcome is maturity in the faith. Ephesians chapter 4 Verses 11 through 16, Paul talks about the progress in the faith. They gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints 
for the work of ministry. Folks, it's the job of pastors and leaders to equip the saints. But understand this, it's to equip the saints and then what? So that the saints work in ministry. Every single person has a job to do. Every single person that God has brought to be part of the body of Christ here at Ramoth Baptist Church has a job to do. That job may not be the same as when you were younger, but if you're still here and you're still physically and mentally able, God has a job for you to do. He's got a job for us to do. But it's to equip the saints, what for the work of ministry, and for the saints, what for building up the body of Christ. And here's the end game. Until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are what? To grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly. It takes every part. It takes every single member of the body of Christ here at Ramoth Baptist Church to work properly. For building up it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. It's about the church progressing in our faith. And it's about the church progressing in the joy that we have in our faith. Uh, Folks, we among all people should be the most joyful people. Doesn't mean that our circumstances are happy, but we rejoice in all things. Paul in Romans chapter 15 verse 13 says this, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Fill you with all joy and peace in believing. In other words, fill you with all joy and peace because of your faith. Folks, God is a God who fills our cup up. And our joy, our peace, and our hope are found in Him and Him alone. And so this morning, where's your cup? Is it full to overflowing with joy and with peace and with hope? Have you never gotten a cup because you've never repented and believed in Jesus Christ as personal Savior and Lord? You will never experience true peace, true joy, true hope, true salvation, true freedom from the broken chains. Unless and until you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. This morning, some of you need to do that. For the very first time just like those students this morning you need to do that for the very first time but there's some christians here this morning that your cup's not overflowing your, your cup is almost bone dry we sang just a moment ago that we have a god who will fill that cup this morning some of you need your cup filled some of you need it topped off to where it's overflowing to experience today the joy and the peace and the hope that comes in and through Jesus and him alone for in the end it really is all about him you see Paul in verse 26 concludes this section by saying so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Oh, Paul would be the means that God would use. But don't miss this. They would not glory in Paul. They would only glory in Christ Jesus. Because of what Paul would do, because of his example, because of his life, they would ultimately give glory to where it is due, and that's to Christ and Christ alone. So we leave with these questions as we conclude this morning. Are you living in such a way that you are personally glorying in Christ? Glorying in his salvation, glorying in his grace, glorying in his mercy, glorying in his love, glorying in his joy, in his peace, 
in his hope? Are you glorying today in Christ? But then, number two, are you living a life that by example, you will lead others to glory in Christ? It's about how we live. To live is Christ. To die is gain. But until the work is done, and until the growth is done, God says, I'm not finished with you yet. God's still working on me to make me what and who he wants me to be. He's still working on you. He's still working on on this church. 150 years, there is still work to do. Not just on Sunday morning, but wherever our feet might take us this week. Let's work till Jesus comes. Let's work till Jesus comes. Let's work till Jesus comes. And then we'll be gathered home. But right now, it's still time Let's pray. Father God, thank you this morning for the work that you have called us to do, not just as individual Christians, but more importantly, as part of the body of Christ here at Ramoth Baptist Church. Father, the fields are wide unto harvest, and there's so many that we know, and our families, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, who are lost without Jesus and need us to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who need us to be about carrying out the Great Commission and making disciples, who need us to love you and to love others, who need us to share that you love this world so much that you were willing to give your one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The work that you've given us to do is the work that only the church can do. No other organization can do it. We're the ones. Father, I pray that this week, as we scatter out of the mission field, that you would help us to work like never before, that you'd help us to speak like never before, to love like never before, to make an impact like never before. And Father, I pray this morning that you would empower us through your Holy Spirit to do just that. If there's anyone here this morning, believer, that needs to have their cup filled up, Father, as they come to you and seek your face, would you fill up their cup yet again with your joy, with your peace, with your hope? And if there's anyone here who has never experienced that joy, that peace, that hope, that forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ and Christ alone, would you open their hearts and minds, draw them to the cross, to the empty tomb, that they might repent and believe the gospel and be saved, to call upon the name of the Lord. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Father, as your spirit moves, as we respond, not just to hear, but as we do what you're calling us to do, in Jesus' name. Amen.